The following podcast contains explicit language. It's Tuesday, October 7th, 2014. From Slate, it's the gist. I'm Mike Pesca. The other day, I saw a bear. It was dead in Central Park. Wow, not the beloved children's rhyme you were expecting. So many unanswered questions about a dead baby bear, three months old, dumped in Central Park. Now, I'll give you, it's weird, it's sad, it's a little sad. You hear baby bear, you think porridge. Not too hot, not too cold. You don't think body was spotted in the early morning hours, appeared to have been dragged to a thicket of bushes, which is actually the case with this bear. In the pictures I've seen, there's this cordoned off area, a team of like five or six concerned looking officials. Presumably the guys in suits are detectives. There's a guy in green, I think a park ranger, uniformed officers. And this is where the urban procedure butts up against the natural world. I doubt there was a natural cause of death of this bear. Bears didn't wander into the zoo. They have counted all the bears in the Central Park Zoo. They're accounted for. Bronx Zoo doesn't even have black bears. But in places not too far from the park, like in suburban New Jersey, bears are becoming as common as raccoons. There are 6,000 to 8,000 bears in New Jersey. One killed a guy less than a month ago. But when it comes to the city, perceptions change, attitudes change. We see this every once in a while. A goat will escape a live market in the Bronx, and they'll become a cause celeb, and they'll get adopted and given a name like Isadora or Duncan, or the goat that was found on Christmas will be called Noel, and they'll live in a sanctuary. I was in Little Italy the other day, the old St. Patrick's Church. They now have three sheep, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Instructions for visitors are detailed. Don't feed them. Don't pet them. Quote, let us watch over them prayerfully and respect them from a distance. You look at a sheep, you look at a sheep, you can actually volunteer to be a shepherd, which means signing up for specific hours to monitor a live webcam. Good luck fitting that large shepherd's crook into your studio apartment. Can you imagine what an actual shepherd thinks of this? There are 1,500 shepherds in the U.S. tending 6 million sheep, average flock 400. So here we are volunteering to watch one sheep by cell phone. They must think of this, the the real shepherds must think of this, what a trauma surgeon thinks of Operation, the wacky doctor's game from Milton Bradley. But it is part of our relationship, we urban dwellers, our relationship with animals. In the natural world, animals are food or predators or objects of respect, maybe danger, definitely a nuisance at times. In the urban world, they're cute, they're quirky. We treat them like characters from books that have been made alive as opposed to figures in real life that have been anthropomorphized into stories. And speaking of animals, bulls and the excrement they're in, or actually they're out. Anyway, we play Is That Bullshit? The Science Game with Maria Konnikova. And in the spiel, the most interesting things Americans aren't interested in. But first, Ebola and a deep dive into the mathematical formula that will help epidemiologists follow the outbreak. The other day, day, I met a bear, a a great big bear, bear. way up there, there. the The other day. R naught. It is a capital R with a subscript zero. It is a number, really a mathematical concept. It's going to tell us everything we need to know about Ebola. Will R naught or not? The number is a little less simple than I've let on. Trust me, it's being calculated. It's being used by epidemiologists. It's a tool. It's not a solution, though. Joining me now to talk about R naught is Nina Pfefferman. She's the principal investigator of the Pfefferman Lab. Let me read what her research focus is. This is from the website, Mathematical and Computational Models of Biological Systems Related to Epidemiology, Evolutionary and Behavioral Ecology, and Conservation Biology. Hello, Nina. Hello. Thank you for having me. So when it comes to Ebola... What sorts of things are you looking at before we even get to R-naught? With Ebola, really what we're looking at right now is the behavioral aspect from my lab's perspective of what can we do to affect how people are careful around the virus, how people behave in terms of managing their own risk, and trying to predict what, that, what impact that will have on transmission if and when it gets to different places. Oh, and so where's the math come in with that? Ah, so math is everything with that. So the good news about epidemiology is that for infectious diseases, we're actually really good at using mathematical models to predict how many people will get sick, when will they get sick, where will they get sick, as long as we know the the three big input questions. The three big inputs that we need in order to to be able to make those predictions are, as you say, the R-naught of the disease. That's sort of the epidemiological properties of the disease. How is it passed? How often does one case spawn a new case? 
that's one big piece. The second big piece is the immunological and physiological profile of the population in which it's circulating. So how healthy are people already? Have they seen a related disease before which gives them partial or full immunity? Is there a vaccine available and have people taken it? Those kinds of questions. So that's the host profile. And then the last one is the behavioral profile of how do people behave? Uh, do they still touch each other? Do they still travel the same way? If we know those three big pieces, we actually have some really fantastic mathematics that can basically tell us with really good accuracy. And we've shown that over and over again with different outbreaks of different diseases in different places, uh, both historically validated and in predicting ongoing current outbreaks for the last 15, 20 years or so. Uh, we're really pretty good at figuring out where diseases will get when and how bad they'll be if we know those three things. They seem also interrelated. So you say the r naught, which is how they spread, but doesn't isn't that affected by the populations that a person will come into contact with? How can you say, oh, this is how many people uh, will be affected? What if the, that person is working in a nursing home and he comes into con- That's a contact fantastic with... question. Yeah, he comes mm-hmm. into contact with people with bad immunity, and what if he's, you know, a rural farmer who almost comes into contact with no one? That is a great question. So so that is, in fact, a huge portion of the research, and it, it brings up a really good question about that value r naught that we're, we, we're going to get to in a little bit, apparently. But there's a theoretical r naught which is simply a property of the disease itself, and it's assumed essentially to be in a vacuum so that we get to talk about it without worrying about those contact-based issues that are transmission and behaviorally based, which is simply essentially how infectious is the disease. If you assume that the other two pieces go away, you assume there's no immunity, there's no treatment, there's no differences in health among a potential puddle of people, Mm -hmm. and then you inject one sick person and you assume that they mix all of the time with everybody, how many new cases is that likely to to bring up? And that's actually why R0 has the R as the name. It stands for the reproductive value. It's essentially the same as asking how many baby diseases does that disease get to have. Mm Mm-hmm. So and it's, so you could also think of it as replacement value. It's either reproductive or replacement, depending on if you come from biology or physics. Right. And if the replacement drops below one, the disease is going to die out. Is that right? Exactly. And it's exactly the same as thinking of it biologically. If, if every individual has less than one kid to replace themselves in the population, then it might be a slow decline but the population is going to, to go out extinct because there aren't enough to keep it going. Um, it, because humans reproduce sexually, usually we think of that as, as every pair has two kids, but really it boils down to what is the expected number of kids that each individual produces to replace themselves to keep the population going. So if that number goes below one, that means that each individual in the population will produce less than one person to replace themselves, that's not sustainable, which is why that R0 is a really good theoretical threshold, because if it's less than one, we know the disease is going to die out or become low-level endemic. If it's over one, then we know that each disease is having more than replacement value of itself babies. That means that the number of, of diseases in the disease population are growing. Ebola is between one and two, so it's not a very virulent disease, right? Depending, again, on your definition of virulence, so the important thing to realize about are not is that the threshold is really the exponent in an exponential function. And, and what an exponential function means is that the rate of new cases of the disease is going to be proportional to the current number of diseases. So that means that a very small change in the exponent can mean a huge difference in the number very, very quickly as long as that number is over one. But measles has an R0 of like 18. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. so measles is a much more transmissible disease. Part of the reason that you don't hear epidemiologists freaking out about measles as much, although you're starting to hear us freak out about it more and more these days, is that it's vaccine preventable, mm-hmm. which means that the most people in the population, so this is that second chunk that I was talking about earlier of what does the host population look like? Yeah there's already a lot of immunity, which means that even though R0 is much bigger, that's that theoretical R0, where if you took a whole bunch of susceptible people and put one person with measles in there, we'd expect 18 new cases. But in the developing world, there's really nowhere you can go to find 18 people you could come in contact with to give them the disease. Got it. So, so what we do is we move over to something called effective R0, which is no longer... The, the theoretical R0 that says how transmissible is the disease, 
But now it says, okay, if you limit R0 by those two other pieces, the immunological profile of the disease and the behavioral patterns that govern transmission, how many cases is it likely to spawn then? And for measles in, in the U.S., for example, that's well under one because we've got such good vaccine coverage from the measles mumps rubella vaccine. Um, now, we're starting to see outbreaks of measles again in the U.S. because people are are rejecting the vaccine for their children. And this is the problem of uh, herd immunity. Yeah. Herd immunity is the idea that if the average person that an infected person sees is immune, then even if you're not immune, having gotten the, the vaccine or, or just being susceptible because you didn't get the vaccine, um, there's no routes of transmission to you. No sick people will come in contact with you because on average, sick people will only see immune people. Then the disease will die out before it would get to you, the other susceptible person. Going back to a second for r not, is this calculated by looking at the disease in a Petri dish or is this calculated using real life and factoring all the other factors we've talked about? What a, oh, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, so it's definitely not a Petri dish calculation. In an ideal world, scientists would just be able to to wave our hands and go, oh, the R0 for this disease, because we've seen it in a perfect setting where we controlled all of the other variables and then we just saw what it did, then the theoretical R0 is this number. But in practice, the only way to do that, it really would be to see it circulate among a crowd of susceptible people. And that's, if nothing else, a really unethical experiment. Mm-hmm. So we have some r naughts that are experimentally determined by some really questionable human trials in the 1930s and 40s for things like the common cold or the flu or some gastrointestinal diseases right. where really scientists did get people to sign up for trials and say, come stand in a room and have someone sneeze on you. So by the way, once we're done wringing our hands about how, un- how unethical they were, d- did the information help us? <laughs> um, it helped a little bit. It didn't help in ways we couldn't figure out in other ways. Okay, good. Thank God. I didn't want the Joseph Mengele seal of approval with any of this. Right. No, no. So it it is the case that there are a lot of good shortcuts if we had no ethics to guide us, but Mm -hmm. they are only good until you start worrying about things like, oh, God, that's a horrible thing to ever do to anybody. We should never do that. Express it however you wish or if you don't wish, but you're an expert. Maybe give me the most likely way that Ebola will play out. Maybe you want to say there's a... X percent probability it will have almost no effect. There's an X percent probability we'll have (laughs) some sort of contagion. Go ahead. So the the big thing to me that I don't know how to handicap the percent for how Ebola will play out globally is, does the world get its act together and really help in Africa now? And the depressing part of the answer to that so far has been, we've known that this is coming at least for four or five months probably more like six or seven. I was having conversations with colleagues back in February or March going, oh, this one's going to be bad. That's a long time for the nations of the world to not get their act together and show up and help in a practical and meaningful way. So a lot of my intuition about what's going to happen over the next couple of years as this plays out globally depends a huge amount on whether or not we successfully intercede now in Africa. And it's already, I mean, the world is seeing it's already too late to make sure this stays a within Africa problem uniquely, but it's still a vast majority in Africa problem. And right now, the globally could make sure, essentially, that we, we really help out on, with regional control, and it doesn't become a widespread problem anywhere else this time. Nina Pfefferman, the principal investigator of the Pfefferman Lab. She's interested in, among other things, the effects of stress on population in fluctuating environments and how best to maintain human societal infrastructure in the face of pandemic disease. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. So there's a famous study, it was cited in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. People were told some words like gray or Florida, and they walked down the hall. And the people who got words that were associated with old things walk slower than the people who got quick, jaunty words. Other examples of this, people who were asked to engage in abstract thought are more willing to agree with the idea of killing one person to harvest organs. If you start thinking about money, you're less likely to help strangers who dropped a pencil. I was just reading this study, Is Love a Journey or Perfect Unity? 
it seems like they've made quite a few leaps. So joining me in this leap is Maria Konnikova. She covers science for The New Yorker. She joins us, oh, every other week or so to discuss this in our frame, where we call it, Is This Bullshit? So hello, Maria. How are you? Hi, Mike. Doing well. How are you? I think this thing is, is it called framing? Is it called, I mean, these experiments that I see all the time where they're asked to evoke an idea and those who evoked a certain idea felt a certain way. That's like framing, right? Well, that's framing and priming. priming. So the, the original um, study that you talked about is probably the most famous example of this. It was done by John Barge, who's a psychologist at Yale University, and it's called the Florida Effect. Mm-hmm. The idea is that our environment constantly affects how we feel and how we act. And so if you can have subtle cues in the environment, they can affect our walking yeah. or you just, know, our heart rate. So it does seem that that study, which is from the mid-90s, was very much just trying to see if priming is a thing. It's caused this crisis in social psychology. Really? Are our effects replicable or... Basically, are they bullshit? Well, well have other <laughs> people tried to tell they people have. Florida and gray? And, and it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. So I personally think that priming is real. Yeah. So there is such a thing as subtle effects in the environment, which will affect how you feel. For instance, Schwartz, whose study you cited last, did this really famous experiment with Gerald Clore back in the early 80s, where they had people basically ask them how they were feeling and how satisfied they were with their life on days that were rainy or days that were sunny. And they found that people were much happier and reported higher life satisfaction on sunny days than on rainy days. And they didn't realize that the weather was affecting their answer to this question, but it was. Mm -hmm. And that's been replicated many, many times over. And that whole theory is called mood as information. And I think one of the problems with the Florida effect is it's so incredibly well known now. You know, if you stop 10 people on the street, I'm guessing some of them would actually know what you're talking about because Malcolm Gladwell has popularized right. it so much. And if they know it, it's not going to work on them anymore. And it will be easy to stop 10 people if they have just seen or heard the words gray in Florida because they'll be walking so very slowly. <laughs> exactly. Right. It does seem, though, that... I don't want to throw this survey under the slow-moving bus of retirees <laughs> going to the casino. But they seek to ask, is love a journey or unity? And the only way they get at this is to prime people with words about love and journeys and unities. And then they say the people who are primed with the unity words have certain opinions that are different from the people who are primed with the journey loves. Mm-hmm. And then we're supposed to figure if it's unity or journey. And we're just supposed to take as true that those primed <laughs> with the unity words are thinking in the unity way. It seems useless, actually. So that's the other thing about priming. The fact that it's real and fragile doesn't actually mean that you can draw all sorts of conclusions like this. And it doesn't mean that a study like this is actually showing what it says it's showing. So what they actually did here was there are two different ways of getting at it. First, they gave people expressions, things like, look how far we've come, that would be journey, or we are one, that's unity, obviously. And then, as you said, they had them recall either two conflicts in their own relationship or two celebratory moments. And then they asked about satisfaction. And what they found was that people who are looking at it as you know, we are one, you know, one soul, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, are less able to deal with conflicts immediately after. Then they had them do puzzles. This is the other version of the study where it was either two shapes that fit together to make a whole unity, or you do a little maze journey. And then once again, you recall either conflicts or celebrations and again, evaluate relationships. And what I think they're doing has nothing to do with, especially in that second study, it has nothing to do with how you feel about your relationship or about priming. It's all about, I'm getting you to you know, do these sorts of things. And so in the moment, two minutes after, yeah. I'm still thinking in that way. Ten minutes after, probably yeah. not. It seems, and, it seems that... Maybe I'm willing to believe that you've done a maze, and so that puts you in a journey state of mind. But then to 
extrapolate that people in that temporary journey state of mind have anything to say about the value of looking at relationships like a journey is extremely no, far-fetched. that's exactly right. Yeah. And especially, so when they did the maze, they weren't even talking about their own relationship. Right. They were given a hypothetical scenario. Yeah. Like, look at this couple, they're fighting, or look at this couple, they're getting along. How would you evaluate their relationship? Well, I mean, it seems pretty obvious that if you were kind of talking about love being a journey and all these things that you were like, oh, yeah, it's a journey. I can apply what I was just told yeah. <laughs> to this. And yeah. here, here's my here's my answer to your question within your study. Am I going to go outside now and think, oh, love really is a journey or love really is unity? No, of course not. And it does, to me, suggest that the idea of priming has gone way too far. It absolutely has. People now think, you know, I can flash an American flag in front of you and suddenly you're going to be much more patriotic in answering your questions. Well, maybe, maybe not. Right. If some priming studies have validity and some, the Florida study, maybe don't, is there a commonality to the ones that you think work well? And is there, you know, a through line between the ones that maybe are BS? Well, all of my favorite priming studies have to do with cues in the environment that actually exist. So no one's trying to trick you. No one's trying to give you some sort of test or manipulate you in that way. It's something like I had mentioned the Schwartz and Clore study with the weather. It's raining outside or it's sunny outside. It actually is. No one has changed the weather. And those are things that we experience every day. So it actually mimics something that we go through life experiencing. There's another one, messy rooms, for instance, uh, make you behave a little bit differently than clean rooms. So if you're in a messy environment, um, you're more likely to cheat or to cut moral corners than in a clean environment, just because that primes, you know, certain ideas of what type of environment this is. Again, that probably comes from contact with both types of things. Or I think there's some great work done by uh, psychologists like Dan Ariely that show that if you have a mirror, for instance, in a room, you're much less likely to cheat on a test because you see yourself, you see your reflection, and you're kind of reminded of the fact that you probably want to be a good person. All of these things are primes in right. a way, but they're not... You know, it's it's not the same thing as having me do a puzzle, and in one of the puzzles I have honesty words, and in one of the puzzles I have cheating and dishonesty words. Words that would be the the equivalent, um, and I don't think that those types of studies are nearly as valid. Okay, so we're going to do two. Is this bullshit? One, a journey is a better way to look at a relationship than unity. Is that bullshit? Personally, I don't think so, but in this study, yes, yeah, it is study, bullshit. Study doesn't show that at all. <laughs> Secondly, priming studies, are they bullshit? A lot of them, unfortunately, are. Priming, I think, is not bullshit as a concept, but a lot of these studies really take it too far and don't show what they say they show. By saying the word bullshit, am I subtly priming you to believe in bullshit? And to embrace the word. Yeah, all right. And I... other swear words, probably. Fuck yeah. All right, Maria Konnikova comes by every so often. She plays as that bullshit. She covers science for The New Yorker. She sullies her reputation a bit on this show. We love her for it. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. And now the spiel, not knowing as a learning experience. Pew, the polling people, pew. You always got to contextualize that. Even if your mind doesn't naturally waft towards the general notion of odor when you hear pew, there's of course Pepe Le Pew. I always want to say pew, great pollsters, the guys at pew. They ask questions to Americans. They have a study out. From ISIS to unemployment, what do Americans know? They gave 1,000 Americans 12 questions. If anyone got all 12 right, they could risk it all in the bonus pollster round or settle for a dinette set. No, actually, they were trying to find out what people know about current events and actually to find out things like, do Republicans know more than Democrats? Yep, a little. If college-educated people know more than less-educated people? Yes, especially on questions about Common Core in Ukraine. Do the old know more than the young? Generally, yes, exception. The youngest group of people were the most likely to know that 15% of Americans lived under the poverty line. But I was most interested in the economic questions. The question that was the easiest for people who took this quiz to get right was an economic question. What's the minimum wage? Choices. Five and a quarter, seven and a quarter, 10.50, 12.50. 73% of 
Americans knew that it was 725. It was one of the three questions on the quiz that most people got the right answers to. The other ones where the majority knew was that ISIS was operating in Syria and that Ukraine was once part of the USSR. But the three questions that the public performed the worst on were also economic. Who is the chair of the Federal Reserve? What does the government spend more on? The choices were social security, the national debt, foreign aid, and transportation. And finally, what percent of Americans live below the poverty line? 5, 15, 25, or 35%. Now, what's interesting about all the wrong answers is that they weren't just wrong. They were worse than randomly wrong. If you asked monkeys these questions, about 25% of monkeys would get the answer right. And when you factor in that in real life, there have to be, I don't know, 10, 12, whatever percent who solidly know that poverty afflicts about 15% of Americans or that we spend the most on Social Security, we have a worse than random number. People are worse than random at picking the right answers to these questions. In fact, on that poverty rate question, the right answer was the third most popular choice. More people said 35% of Americans were at or below the poverty line, and 25% came in second. I would venture to say it's probably a reflection on the news media playing up bad news, emphasizing the very real gap between rich and poor, but also giving the wrong impression that twice as many people are poor as actually are poor, Also, let's factor in the fact that the poverty line is pretty low. Maybe 25% better reflects a level that other Americans would think of as poor. Anyway, the other question about what the government spends the most on is extremely telling. And it's frequently reflected in polls. Foreign aid was given. That was the most popular answer given. 33% of respondents thought the U.S.'s biggest expenditure of the four things listed was foreign aid. And 26% said that servicing the national debt was the biggest expense. Only 20% knew that it was Social Security. How wrong is it to say foreign aid? A little less than a quarter of the U.S. budget. Over $800 billion is spent on Social Security. Foreign aid accounts for less than 1% of the budget. The uh, servicing the debt is $220 billion. That's about 6% of the budget. This tells me a few things. People really aren't informed. Make all the excuses you want. We're busy. We're good, hardworking, decent people. Whatever. We need to know more. We're ignorant. Not just listeners, I mean. But also, we see this show up in that constant news quiz called Public Opinion Polling on the State of the Economy. Right now, Americans' opinions of the economy is lagging the economy. The economy is kind of booming, relatively booming, booming in a 2014 sort of way. It's adding jobs, unemployment is low, below 6%, but people say it doesn't feel booming. You always hear an explanation for why people might not think it's booming. Reasons like, well, you know, in inflation-adjusted terms, real wages haven't really risen, and the growing gap between rich and poor seems stark. Here's another reason that's less flattering to the decent, hardworking Americans. Americans. People are ignorant on economic matters. If there was a report out that said, we selected a group of Americans, 80% of whom couldn't answer a relatively simple question about the U.S. budget, and we asked this group of Americans what they thought about the economy, I think we all would say, I don't want to hear these people's opinions. But you know what that group of Americans is? That's Americans. That's where we are. 80% of us did not know that we spend more on Social Security than we do on things like foreign aid and servicing the national debt and even transportation. That's us. We're misinformed on these matters. The young, usually more misinformed than the old. High school dropouts, a bit more misinformed than college grads. And it's a shame. And by the way, I got one wrong on the quiz. I thought 15% was a little high for the poverty rate. I thought 5%, that was the lower choice, was a little low. So I got it wrong. I blame the media, just not podcasts. That's it for today's show. I want to mention this. If you're listening to this today on Tuesday, tomorrow is your chance to see me, to hear me live Wednesday night. Now, if you're hearing this on Wednesday, it's tonight. If you're hearing this around 8.07 p.m. on Wednesday, your chance was seven minutes ago, but it'll go for another hour and a half. I'll be in Brooklyn. I'll be talking sports with my hang up and listen buddies, and I'm going to talk about the 1988 World Series. I will mock Joe Garagiola. Joe Garagiola humor. You don't want to miss it. Go to slate.com slash live for ticket information about this event. Andrea Salenzi is the producer of The Gist. She has been known to fawn over fawns, but if you look closely, you can see that she's cowed by manatees. See, cow? 
Andy Bowers is executive producer of Slate Podcasts, claims a solid alibi on the bear thing, but he had motive, he had opportunity, and a powder test shows the presence of honey on his hands within the last 48 hours. We're on Yo! Get that app. Subscribe to Podcast. We'll tell you as soon as the show is ready. You get an email to this effect, too. That's at slate.com slash gist email. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash slate gist. I go there, I don't know, I'd say just about every day, interact with people who write and complain and criticize. And Kvel. Our Twitter feed is Slate Gist. Email the gist at slate.com. Quick pledge drive mention. We're asking you to pledge to sign someone else up for the gist, to go into their device, ask them their permission, obvs, but actually sign them up. They will thank you. I gotta say, I never wished harm on a bear or a cub in my life. Well, maybe once, Sean Dunstan, he literally ran the other direction when I asked him a question he didn't want to answer, but I have no ill will towards bears. Thanks for listening. The United States' largest military base in the Middle East is not located in Israel or Saudi Arabia or Jordan. It's in Qatar. The largest voice of the Arab world to the outside does not emanate from the most populous nation in the Middle East, Egypt. It's Al Jazeera, and it's based in Qatar. When the U.S. wants to negotiate with the Taliban or other Islamic extremist groups, it often goes through Qatar. When American journalist and author Peter Theo Curtis was freed by Islamic rebels in Syria, who negotiated that? Qatar. But in order to have this sway with radical elements throughout the world,